So I'm here at the home of Dr. Lacey, which is an incredible private museum. And he told me that he had a surprise for me. And so I come up and man, I'm excited about this prize. And I want him surprise that he, that he gave me and I want him to talk about it. But, but first I want to show you just a few things in his, this incredible uh, museum of his. And the first thing, Dr. Lacey, what are we looking at here? Uh, this is Clark Gable's coat from Gone with the Wind. In the final scene, he says, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. And here is the official uh, MGM label. And they normally made two uh, costumes for every uh, major star, but they only made one for the final scene in case something got dropped on it. And inside the pocket is some of Gable's tobacco and it's worth between a hundred and fifty and three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. The tie is from another scene in Gone with the Wind and also is Harry Houdini's coat from uh, 1909 with 17 secret pockets and this is uh, a rare coat because normally his coats only came to his elbow because he wanted to show that there was nothing up his sleeve. But there's 17 secret pockets in here and some of Fred Astaire's bow ties and some of locks of Houdini's. And I have a number of locks of Houdini's and keys. So let me ask you real quick, and then I'm dying to get to this, what you, uh, the, the surprise you gave me. But let me ask you this. So you're saying that Clark Gable's coat's worth a hundred and some odd thousand. How did you, why did you end, how did you end up with it, and what did, what did it cost you? Uh, I paid around $800 for it. A friend of mine worked for MGM Studios uh, before they had the big auction in 1970, and I was doing the play uh, Miracle Worker, and I w wanted something to bring in the audiences, and we were sold out eight days in a row, and women showed up just to see the coat. They didn't care about the play. And it was in the play for all of five minutes. And then after the women had to try the coat on because they wanted to wear the coat that Clark Gable wore in, in the final scene where the f first time a swear word was in the movie when he said, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. So the interesting thing to me is that uh, you know, your home, your private museum, is filled with stuff like this and, and 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 the power of collectibles is is crazy unbelievable so anyway so show me a couple other things and then i want to get to the surprise you gave me oh okay let, let let's go see what lincoln has to show us okay let's go see it i have the french coverlet it's a blanket that was in uh, Abraham Lincoln's carries the night he was assassinated. And it's actually just a blanket. And they took it into Ford's Theater to cover Lincoln because there was no heat in Ford's Theater. And it covered him. And there was also a blanket for uh, uh, Mrs. Lincoln. And he had it on him the night that Lincoln was uh, assassinated. And when they laid Lincoln on the floor, he had that on him. And when they carried him across the street to the Peterson house, he still had it on him. And after Lincoln's body was removed, here it is on the bed. And there's blood stains, iodine stains, candle wax, and mustard plaster on it. And the, the unique thing about it, this friend of mine who gave it to me, it came out of the old Herbert Arbach collection. Uh, the first thing that I did, I got it on New Year's Eve in 1990 and laid on my bed and I covered myself with it. And nobody can say that they laid under the blanket that Lincoln died under. Wow. So I was going to ask you, how did you... Um, end up with something like that, but you say you got it out of the Arbac collection. The Arbac oh, collection. How, how, how come they gave it to well, you? Or? Well, Herbert Arbac uh, died in 1945. He was uh, had everything listed in a will, 
his sisters, he never married, his sisters never did anything uh, with it until 1952, and they sold it to an antique dealer. The antique dealer bought it, and I don't know how much he paid for it, but 1958, the antique dealer gave it to his 16-year-old boyfriend, and uh, years later, the boyfriend kept saying, Steve, you need this for your museum. And for three years, he enticed me. And finally, I said, Ralph, you're either going to give it to me or shut up. And he says, oh, no, 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 it's yours. And three months later, my cousin called and said, are you going to be home? That was on New Year's Eve. And I says, yeah. He says, well, I got that French coverlet for you, and I'm going to bring it to you. And so that's how I ended up with it. And it's one of my prized possessions in the museum. Awesome. And, and this museum, man, you got all kinds of prized possessions. It's, it's incredible. But now, that was just a little highlight of your museum. Now I want to get to the real thing, why I'm here, what you gave me. And, and I want to talk about that. And that's uh, Butch Cassidy, the Sundance Kid, Matt Warner, and the Outlaws. And, and, well, and let's... Well, finally, after a number of years... I finally got my new book. Awesome! It has been a labor of love. 61 years of research. I started February 11th, 1960. And I can tell you exactly why that was. is because I wrote to Carbon County because I was in a Utah history class and we had to write to another county and I was from Carbon County and they sent me a brochure and it had the famous Fort Worth picture in there. I had no idea who they were, just knew I liked that picture. And that started me and we'll show you the picture, the brochure right here. I still have it after all these years. Right there it is, because I kept the scrapbook. And there, and that's me at the time. Cool, so so what I'm excited about is, is that you gave me, Steve, a, uh, a first edition of, of this uh, new book. And, and, and they're all sold out, and you saved them for me. And I did. I appreciate that. It, it, it has been a, a labor of love, and the books went really quick. Within three weeks, the first edition was gone. So, so uh, open that book, because when I opened mine, I was flabbergasted, because all the pictures in there, I've never seen a book with so many pictures. There are 886 photos, newspaper clippings, telegrams, and letters in this book. What my original goal for this book was, it's like opening a, up a trunk for the very first time and you find all of these things in there as somebody has saved them very carefully. And I've went through attics, basements, crawl spaces, courthouses, museums, you name it, I've been there and talked to the people that actually knew Butch Cassidy, Matt Warner. Matt Warner was an outlaw with Butch Cassidy for 20 years and then uh, served three and a half years in the old Sugar House prison in Salt Lake and then later became Deputy Sheriff and Justice of Peace of Carbon County, Utah. And I knew Butch Cassidy's sister. She was also my cousin. I didn't know that until about four years ago. She's a distant cousin. And my uh, grandfather had a run-in with the uh, Sundance Kid, and my father was there, and my uncle. So I pretty well know uh, a lot of the gang members through family members, people that actually knew them when they were still alive. I talked to lots of people that no one else has had an opportunity to talk to. So, and you've taken me on a few of your expeditions yeah. to show me some of the secret hideouts and some yeah. of the different things, and man, and it was, it was great fun. Yeah, we went down 
uh, my father found the secret hideout of Butch Cassidy's in 1954. And he was out uh, staking uranium claims and uh, building roads with a cat and a grader. And this was 40 miles southeast of the present robber's roost. And when I took you down, it was awesome. But when my dad first went there, he found all these signatures in the rock. And there was a magazine he found under one of the overhangs. The magazine was from the 1890s. And someone wrote, I wonder who will find this. And he signed his name. Hmm. This was in 1954. And we lived in Wellington, Utah, above my grandparents' beer joint. And my grandparents had an apartment that hooked onto the beer joint. And that magazine passed back and forth, back and forth. And I was too young to really remember uh, what the name was on that magazine. But I remember it. And my dad couldn't remember the name on it. But we talked about going out there and seeing those signatures in the rock. And... Finally, I convinced my dad in 1984 to go out there and we found the signatures and it was awesome. And then we went out again and looked at the signatures and got to really ex exploring around and found out that this was the hideout of Butch Cassidy and Elza Lay and Elza Lay's common law uh, wife from September of 1896 until May of 1897. It was so awesome. And the signatures in the rock were minor outlaws that was on the wanted list by Governor Heber Manning Wells. And we found the actual place where they camped. You could see right where the beds were. You could see there was a stove that was still there. It was as if they had left there yesterday. The tent posts were still there. The cave where Butch uh, slept was amazing. And then there was another little cave where they kept the horses so that uh, you couldn't see it. It was awesome they had taken the buckboard off of the uh, one wagon and it's still there it was for the bottom of the one tent it was awesome and i've taken a number of people out there there's 31 people that's been out to it that are still alive the rest of the people that died because they got old and the people that i've taken out there can't tell you how to get into it because they can't remember. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> it, it is 32 miles off the main road, but it takes three and a half hours to get to it. And it's because it goes up and down and around and around and... A lot of twisted, windy well, canyons. It does. Yeah. But it's an awesome place. I, it's one of my favorite places to go to. Let me explain a little bit about uh, the book. I had, uh, uh, while we were out at the secret hideout, as we were coming out, you know, I brought out a book. This is my 10th book that I have put together. And as we were coming out of the secret hideout, my friend Lily uh, Martin, and I can't pronounce her last name because she married a guy from Syria. And she was originally from Fresno, California. And she had texted me and wanted to know if my Frank Irvin was related to her Frank Irvin. Now, who's Frank Irvin? Well, I'll explain that here in just okay. a second. In 19, November 21st, 1939, Frank Irvin came and visited with Joyce Warner and Elma Warner. Uh, Joyce Warner was the daughter of outlaw Matt Warner and Elma was the wife of Matt Warner and Matt Warner had died in 1938. And he came to visit and uh, anyway he started telling stories about Matt and, uh, and him together and they got to talking and pretty soon they realized this was Butch Cassidy. And 
they had corresponded back and forth and it spent a day that November 21st day uh, visiting and he told stories about Matt and him doing things together and and they used to celebrate their birthdays together because uh, Matt's birthday was April 12th and Butch's birthday was April 13th and uh, Joyce and I released that story in 1980 to the public and Joyce and her mother had uh, just finished her father's book and it what didn't get released until 1940 and they saw the the purpose of uh, of writing down everything that Frank said because Frank Irvin was the alias that Butch was using after he came back from South America and I got to trying to doing research and finding out what happened to to Frank and I I couldn't find him I looked all over I looked on the internet I looked everywhere and I thought maybe he had changed his name and I thought in my 2000 book I thought he changed his name to McMullen, which was a relative, uh, uh, his relative's last name was McMullen. I thought he changed his name and died March 16th, 1943. Well, this Lily said, is your Frank Irvin and my Frank Irvin the same guy? And we got to compare notes and signatures and come to find out it was the same Frank Irvin but he didn't die March 16th, 1943. Got to finding out that Butch Cassidy died June 2nd, 1956. Mm. That made Butch Cassidy 90 years old. We think in re relationship, how can that be? He was an outlaw at the turn of the last century. He couldn't have lived that uh, that old. But when uh, she got me in touch with Butch's great-grandchildren, and they provided me with photos of Butch, everything matched to, into place. Because when Butch came and visited with Joyce and her mother, he said he had two daughters. And... I couldn't figure out when I start, started checking genealogy. He had more than two daughters. He had a son. He had a stepdaughter. Now how can that be? He wasn't telling the full truth. And come to find out, he had married before he went to South America. He had uh, uh, met his wife in Park City. And got her pregnant before they went to, uh, he went to South America. And then uh, he went to New York. And everybody said that Butch bought at a place a watch. They paid $40 from, uh, from Tiffany's and bought a $40 watch and gave it to Etta. Well, he didn't. He bought a watch for $40, but he got, gave it to his wife who was since then had moved to California. Then he took off to uh, uh, South America and didn't see his first child until the child was almost a year old. Came back and all of a sudden met his son who he had named Arthur. Now why would he name him Arthur? Well, Butch, his younger brother, Arthur, who was also an outlaw, um, was killed in 1890 in Telluride, Colorado. So he named his son in honor of his brother, Arthur, because he favored his brother, Arthur. Well, while he was visiting with his wife and his son, he gets his wife pregnant. And he's only there for couple of months, takes off, goes back to South America. Well, a year later, he shows up again, 
sees his daughter Esther for the first time. Well, guess what? While he's there seeing his daughter for the first time and reacquainting with his son, Arthur, and his stepdaughter, uh, Annie, he gets his wife pregnant again. Well, he takes off, goes back to South America. This time, he doesn't see his wife for around three years. And then he comes back and sees his final daughter, uh, Ruthann. Um, but then we talk about, everybody says, oh, the big shootout took, out, took place in South America uh, November 7th, 1908. Well, guess what? Butch left South America February, after February 16th, 1908. He returned to California, spent a couple of months there, and Butch couldn't be tied down for any length of time. And we have him documented in Alaska, witnessing a wedding, not just attending a wedding. He was a witness, and it was in the newspaper under the name Frank Irvin. Well, Sundance came back at the same time, and he was visiting with his brother, Elwood, in San Francisco. So the two men that robbed the payroll in South America, they were killed, but it just wasn't Butch and Sundance. And then years later, back in uh, the 1990s, there was a crew who went down and dug up the two outlaws, and they were they weren't Butch and Sundance. It was the two men who had actually robbed the payroll. But people said, well, it wasn't Butch and Sundance, so it couldn't have been them. Uh, they think that they're still buried in the cemetery down there, but it's, it's not, they're not buried there. Sundance, he is another story. Sundance came back and spent time in, in Utah he um, couldn't stay out of trouble, and he killed uh, Town Marshal Lon T. Larson in Mount Pleasant, San Pete County, and was on death row. And they took him off death row because they said his, the court trial was flawed, and so they retried him again in Carbon County, gave him the death penalty again, and while he was in prison, I had the opportunity uh, to talk to the prison guards that guarded him that were still alive in the 1970s. And they told me he wrote letters to the Longabaugh family. And I thought, oh, how could, and he was going by the name of Hiram Beebe. And they said, well, how could he be the Sundance Kid? Everyone said, he's 5'3", he couldn't be the Sundance Kid. Everyone said that Sundance Kid was 5'9 to, to 6 feet tall. Well, guess what? In all of the wanted circulars that came out, they kept saying that Sundance was 5'9 was to 6 feet tall. Well, they were using Ben Kilpatrick's picture. Every circular is in the major newspapers, uh, Ben Kilpatrick's picture, and then underneath it said Harry Longenbaugh, that was the Sundance Kid's real name. And so there, there was the confusion of the height. And they also had down, uh, Sundance was bow-legged and his feet far apart. Well, guess what? Sundance's father was around 5'7". Every one of his siblings was short and stocky. His uh, um, two sisters were short and stocky. His two brothers were short. In fact, one brother was a jockey. And there, there's no way that, that Sundance could have been uh, taller than 5'7". If you look at the picture of uh, Sundance and Etta together that was taken in New York, 
Uh, Ed is supposed to be 5'5 five five or 5'4 five and uh, Sundance is like two inches taller. And so I definitely know that Hiram Beebe was the Sundance Kid. He ne never claimed to be the Sundance Kid, but when his court trial came, the two court trials, I've got copies of the old transcripts, says he was in South America. It says that uh, uh, the wanted circulars of Sundance said that he talked about the merits of Ralston cereal products. Now Ralston was a big cereal up until the 1950s and uh, 60s, but um, he'd tell everybody, oh, eat Ralston cereal, eat Ralston pancakes, eat Ralston flour, eat this, and he, he always talked about the merits. I don't know what he did when he was in South America if they could get Ralston cereal. But he had a common law wife when he was in the sugar house prison here in Salt Lake and then they moved to prisoners. When I was four days old in 1951, uh, they moved the prisoners to the point of the mountain and uh, uh, moved him there. His common law wife, Glaim Heasley Beebe, brought him Ralston cereal every two weeks because the commissary didn't provide Ralston cereal for him, and so she brought every two weeks. I talked to the ID man, Ray Howder, and he said she was like clockwork bringing him Ralston cereal. And I talked to uh, uh, Van Porter, who was a reporter for the uh, f reporter photographer for the Salt Lake Herald and the Salt Lake Tribune. His first uh, duty was the Sugar House Prison and then the Point of the Mountain and he said I, I, I remember him getting letters from the Longabaugh family all while he was in prison and all uh, and getting letters and writing letters he says because Longabaugh was a strange name in those days the reporters walked right in in the prison you know, it wasn't just, they were co-mingled with the prisoners. And he says, I remember him getting letters. And somebody told me, he says, oh, it must have been a mistake that they uh, that he wrote the Longabaws in Cortez, Colorado. That was his cousins that he came out west with from Illinois after he left Pennsylvania. He followed them all the way and then uh, broke horses and, and so forth. And that's where he first met Butch and uh, Matt Warner and Butch's two brothers, Dan and Arthur, who were outlaws, and Tom McCarty. They got, to, they spent all that time uh, together. But anyway, he corresponded back and forth. And then I talked to Twisty Rich, which is his, uh, he went by the name of Bufo Rich. He was from Wellington and Clarence Cleland. They were guards at the prison. And they told me all about him. And nobody else spent this time and talked to the people that were still around. And uh, there's a surprise in the book, and I won't go into detail. There's just a surprise in the book about, uh, uh, Hiram Beebe, why he spent time at uh, uh, the hospital, Dr. Pierce's Medical Institute. Everybody said, oh, he went there for Katera, which was uh, uh, messed up uh, sinuses, or he went there because he got shot in the leg uh, early on. Wasn't any of that. Or he had VD. That was a big thing that people talked about then said he had VD and some pretend writer historians now have jumped on that bandwagon and said he had VD well when you read my book it'll tell you why he didn't have VD and there's another story that uh, about Butch Butch wrote a letter to a friend and it was he, he wasn't a real close friend and he said you know, I've been laid up. I've had the town disease. Well, 
What is the first thing they tell you when you go to a third world country? They tell you not to drink the water. But all these pretend historians and writers have said, he must have been frisky with the girls, that he got VD. Well, let me tell you something. If you have VD and you're writing a letter, to someone that is a friend but not really a close friend you're not going to tell them that you have VD. What he really had was diarrhea because he said he couldn't ride his horse. If you have VD you can ride a horse all you want but it doesn't affect your riding. His butt was raw and red and you have to remember they were in South America and there was no toilet paper. There wasn't any toilet paper in, in America, most of the places, but uh, a raw, wet rag, and his butt was raw, and so a few days he wouldn't be able to ride. But people have jumped on that bandwagon of, oh, he must have had VD, he must have spent time with the, with the, the girls and got too frisky with them. Well, Queen Anne, and uh, Bassett said that he didn't spend time with the girls. He was very quiet. Didn't like to go uh, to dance, but he liked to go to the dances. He liked to listen to the music. In fact, when he was in San Juan County, he was uh, uh, stationed uh, just above uh, Monticello, and he'd go 40 miles to Bluff when they had the dances down there so he could hear the dances. But he didn't like to dance. But I don't know how many times I've heard stories when I was doing my research that, the, oh, Butch danced with my grandmother or he danced with my great grandmother or I heard the story that Butch put a gold coin under the plate after he got through eating, put a $5 gold coin or a $20 gold coin under the plate. Well, he wouldn't have had time to do any robbing if he had spent that time um, putting gold coins and dancing with the ladies. And my new book shows that Butch didn't do a lot of the robberies. One of the big things that Butch, uh, everyone said that uh, Butch, remember the, in the movie, in the movies, there was a big thing about the trains blowing up. There, there was two trains, and the first one, uh, the Wilcox, the train got blown up, and Butch was blamed for planning it and robbing it. Well, guess what? Butch didn't rob it. And then the Tipton train robbery. Butch was blamed for that. He didn't rob it. And then uh, Butch robbed uh, Montpelier Bank, and he actually did that with El Zalay, uh, August 13th, 1896. But that was the last robbery that he did in the U.S. And then he went down to the secret hideout because El Zalay had just hooked up with his common law wife and he uh, arranged to bring her down to the secret hideout. And when people say, well, Butch and Elza Lay robbed the Castle Gate Mine Paywall robbery. Well, in my book, it shows the documentation that Butch and Elza Lay didn't rob it. It was Johnny Herring and Joe Walker. They were positively identified and they were both killed in May of 1898. And do you know where Butch and Elzalay and, and Elzalay's common law wife were? The two days before the Castle Gate Mine Payroll robbery, they were in Height, Utah, which was 40 miles from the secret hideout down at Cass Heights Place because they went down there for Easter. And so he couldn't have been 
robbing the Castle Gate Mine people robbery. They were down at Cass Heights uh, Ferry. Um, they were enjoying Easter because when they went down there, the Cass Heights, he sold supplies, collected uh, uh, mail and uh, newspapers, and, uh, and, and miners would come in with stories and so forth. So they were uh, getting information of what was going on. And anyway, uh, later on, uh, Butch kept thinking that, you know, uh, he might want to try to get amnesty, but uh, he was thinking of ways to, to do that. And then in 1900, he uh, met this lady. He was working, Butch decided to prove that he was reliable and, he, and uh, he got him a job with the railroad. He was a section crew worker and he met this lady in Park City and when he was working for the railroad he was working in Indianola on a section crew and got pictures of him working on the railroad and Anyway, he met this lady who would be his future wife, Carolina, and she had a daughter named Annie. And I don't know how soon it was before she got pregnant. But before then, uh, he had talked to Heber M. Wells about uh, Getting amnesty for all of his past crimes. Well, for those that don't know, who's Heber M. Wells? Heber M. Wells was the first governor of Utah. Okay. And uh, he wanted to get amnesty for Wyoming, for Colorado, and they wouldn't have even considered giving him amnesty here in Utah had he robbed the Castlegate Mine Payroll robbery, because that happened in Utah. And the people of Utah wouldn't have said, no, you're not going to have amnesty here in Utah because you robbed those miners in Castlegate. And he got to looking and he said, uh, uh, what about Wyoming? You were supposed to have robbed uh, Wilcox, blew up the train. He said, I wasn't there. I can prove it. Well, anyway, and then there was this, this big commotion years later that Butch turned in a rifle and a pistol when he went to meet with Governor Wells. Well, Butch never turned any rifle in, never turned any pistol. In fact, there is no documented firearms of Butch. But one sold for $175,000 plus the auction premium that claims that the pistol was sold in Vernal, 1895 at the Ashley Co-op store. Well, the only problem is the warden didn't give him permission to uh, uh, leave the prison in Wyoming to go to Vernal to buy that from the store. And second off, uh, where would Butch get the pistol in the first place? There's another pistol that some museum has, and, and they said Butch turned this into the Wyoming Penitentiary, and they saved it because they knew Butch Cassidy was going to be famous. <laughs> well, nobody knew who Butch Cassidy was when he went to prison in Wyoming uh, that first time, and why would they save it if they didn't know who he was? But anyway, there's no documented firearms. But anyway, uh, let me tell you, I posted it on Facebook and I've got a picture in my book uh, about the pistol that got sold. And I pasted, posted on Facebook about this pistol not being authentic. Someone contacted the uh, auction uh, people and they said I was wrong about the pistol, that it was authentic. Well, the person that uh, did it, faked it, he wrote 
carved signatures in the inside of the pistol and it wasn't he went and had uh, Lula Parker Bettinson Butch's sister hold the pistol and have her picture taken and she happened to put a, the picture in her book to add authenticity to it and then he used the picture and and put it in gun magazines and said this is Butch's pistol this is one he turned in there was a fake document that was done and I happened to talk to the longtime sheriff of Joab County who later became the public safety director for the state of Utah and I asked him uh, what he knew about it and he says you know if Butch had turned in a pistol and I knew that sheriff he said I'd have known something about it and he says he never turned any pistol in mm. so uh, anyway uh, the Winnemucca bank robbery took place after the Tipton and people are, are saying that Butch robbed it well the bank manager George Nixon when they were sending pictures uh, to him said Butch wasn't there he, uh, he says well he might have wanted to be there but I was there when the robbery took place and I don't uh, he's not one of the men that I I saw but because the Pinkertons was making out the wanted circular and the wanted circular didn't come out until uh, 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 192 or 193 they didn't have any first name people to put on there so they wanted to have Butch on there because Sundance wasn't a well-known uh, individual yet and so they slipped Butch's name on there and then this 10 year old boy who kept coming to the camp uh, before the uh, robbery took place and he wanted this white horse he wanted it really bad and every day for a week before the uh, robbery took place he brought a different horse to try to trade for this white horse and they said no 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 we're not going to trade you but he wanted it really bad but apparently uh, after the robbery um, they used it as a getaway and uh, they gave it to that 10 year old boy but the 10 year old boy couldn't tell you if it was Butch or whatever uh, but he claimed that Butch sent him a picture from South America I'm uh, not South America from Texas that f famous picture but he gave it to the sheriff years later I, and he uh, gave him one other picture of uh, Butch with an Indian and he kept that picture but he didn't know where it was so I I'm sure somebody gave him the horse but Butch wasn't involved with the Winnemucca bank robbery so uh, uh, Butch and Sundance never did a robbery together in the United States hmm. because they just didn't and everybody said oh Butch and Sundance did this and Butch and Sundance did this and they just didn't hmm. but um, you'll see uh, 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 a bunch of pictures that uh, we shot for this uh, this piece of of Butch and and they're copyrighted and uh, got some great stuff pictures uh, there's a there's one picture that shows for years said that this is Butch age 16 17 years old standing by a horse the gun and the shafts are too new wasn't when Butch would have been that age and the saddle is too new it wouldn't have been when he was in 1885 or 1884 it's Butch's son Tommy Hill there's I have a picture right next there and it says Butch's grandson and you can definitely tell that it's Butch's grandson okay there's the other picture and it's of um, both pictures were taken by Charlie 
Charlie Gibbons. Charlie Gibbons was a friend of Butch when he was living in Circleville and they moved to Hanksville and in 1946 Butch or Frank Irvin uh, was in Hanksville and Charles Kelly had come to him in 1949 and says do you have any pictures of Butch? He said oh yeah I got pictures of Butch and he just didn't bother to tell him when when they were taken and right in here in the picture is he says there in the picture is Mike Cassidy and Charles Kelly just assumed that this was Mike Cassidy but it's not Mike Cassidy Mike Cassidy is here in the shadows leaning against the cabin and this is Butch 1946 and what is really amazing you know when Joyce and uh, her mother visited with Butch he said my daughters keep asking Papa don't you have any relatives and he said no nope, don't have any relatives but he never mentioned his son Arthur he never mentioned that he had a stepdaughter Annie and so uh, when they came to Hanksville Charlie Gibbons would have uh, wouldn't have called him Frank Frank Irvin because he didn't know him as Frank Irvin he would have either called him uh, Robert Leroy Parker or he would have called him Butch Cassidy because that's <coughs> that's how he knew him and so Tommy I'm sure he would have said, Grandpa, why does he call you Robert Leroy Parker? Why does he call you Butch Cassidy? Because he wouldn't have known who Butch Cassidy was. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't have known no. who Robert Leroy Parker was. But he would have found out right then. And uh, this is my favorite picture of these two. This is Fort Worth picture. This is Butch in 1942. And you definitely can tell they're the same man. It's amazing. The same man, same chin, same mustache. Just a number of years apart. Mm. And this is what is a really cool picture. This is Sundance's father. Josiah and this is Sundance right here Well, everybody said Hiram Beebe does not look like uh, Sundance He looks like Jimmy Durante this pretend uh, Writer historian has kept saying Jimmy Durante an ugly Jimmy Durante and uh, that is total BS. He looks just like his father in later years, except his ears are just a little protruded and his nose has a little dim uh, dimple at the, there, but they look identical. The eyes, the chin, they're the same. Same man looks just like his father. And they were the same height starting out as 5'7". So, and what is also really cool is this picture. Nobody else has this picture of Schwartz. The, all of the other ones don't have the other logo here printed on this particular picture. And I have the originals hanging right there behind. Cool. where they divided those nobody else has had the originals except me I finally got those out and I've mounted those so that they're not messing up the back of the pictures and all and This is the group picture. I call it the Robbers Roost Gang, but technically there was no gang. Butch was never part of any gang. There was no Robbers Roost. Uh, 
because the name didn't come into effect until 1902 and Butch and Sundance was already in South America and there, uh, they used the name Robber's Roost in the newspaper, I'm not, not Robber's Roost, Wild Bunch. But there was no official gang of the Wild Bunch. And if Butch didn't do those robberies after uh, August 13th, uh, 1896, uh, he couldn't have been involved uh, there. But the newspaper says, Butch Cassidy's ro uh, Wild Bunch did this and Butch Cassidy's Wild Bunch did this and um, anyway um, just because the newspaper says it doesn't mean that an official organization like a newspaper I mean a, a police department or a detective agency or a governor's uh, office used that term Nobody used it until the first time in, in 1902. The Pinkertons didn't officially use it as a, on a, their le, a letter logo until 1903. Hmm. And none of those people with the Fort Worth picture did a robbery together in the, in the U.S. And here's a four-generation picture. This is Butch. This is Butch's... Uh, uh, son Arthur and his his daughter and this little boy here is Stephen and he is the great grandson of, of Butch this was taken in December of 1952 hmm. four generation picture and uh, so, uh, some of the other pictures that you can show uh, it doesn't make any difference of which order uh, it, it shows all of the pictures of Butch and uh, the known pictures and, and everything. It's a fascinating subject. I, uh, and, and I don't want to take away from Matt Warner. Matt Warner, uh, uh, let me tell you one story about Joyce Warner. Joyce Warner was a close friend of mine and so was, uh, was Lula Parker Bettinson who was my cousin. Joyce said to me, she said, you're like a nephew to me. And I said, Joyce, I don't want to be a nephew. She looked at me like, why don't you want to be a, a, ne a nephew? I says, you're like my stepmother. And I'd much rather you be my stepmother than, than a, a nephew, because that's like a pretend. Even though uh, a stepmom is pretend, but we were close, and I, and I always called her my stepmom after that, uh, because we were very, very, very close. Cool. And uh, Lula Parker Bettinson, Butch's sister, and she was only two months old when Butch left, and my students and I. The first time I met her, uh, one of my students and I, we went down and interviewed her for the radio. We were doing a special that was heard in five states. I was teaching radio and TV broadcasting at Emory High School. And it was in June of 1975 that we interviewed her. I still have the tapes of her talking and, and, and uh, we won an award and it was heard in five states. Cool. And anyway, uh, that's how I first got to to meet her and go out to the uh, homestead and it was never a ranch it was always a farm a homestead and then in um, November of 1977 I took another batch of students down and we did another follow-up interview after Larry Pointer's book came out uh, in search of Butch Cassidy um, and she held the book upside down to show that it was not accurate and uh, people have said that she said that William T. Phillips was uh, her brother and she never ever said that but uh, she said to me we were taking pictures outside and and she says when I die would you take pictures at my funeral and I thought that's a strange request uh, um, and I said, okay, 
I didn't know what to say. And when she died, I took pictures and I sent them to her kids. Mm -hmm. And uh, but she was a neat lady. Uh, there was a lot of things she didn't know uh, because she'd gotten in, in an argument with Butch because she blamed Butch for her mother's early death in 1905. But, um, and so he didn't want to talk to her. And when Butch come back uh, after South America, he visited with the family members that he knew. And uh, there was a lot of siblings that were born after he left. And so he didn't really know them. But one other thing before I forget is when he came back from South America in 1910, the 1910 census, his brother-in-law that was married to his sister worked for the same company, Pacific Gas and Electric. And they worked together for the same company. And then later, his daughter, stepdaughter Annie and his uh, daughter Ruth lived four or five houses down the street from his sister and brother-in-law and didn't know they were related. And those two s sisters worked in the same bank as their uncle and didn't know they were related for years. I mean, what's the coincidences yeah. of, of that? And Butch went to his uh, came back in 1917 and visited family in Circleville, came back in 24 to his sister's funeral, came back in 25 and came to his dad's funeral in 38, came to his brother's funeral, Dan, in 42 and visited with his favorite brother, William, in 1940s uh, and he changed his birth date. If you look on Ancestry, and this one guy told me, he says, Ancestry's accurate. And he says, your, your Frank Irvin can't be Butch Cassidy because he has a different birth date. Well, Butch was born April 13th, 1866. Well, when you're picking out an alias or a birth date, you want to pick something out so you can help remember. Well, he kept the A in April and changed it to August, so he had the A. Well, he kept the 13th, because that's the day he was born, was on the 13th. Well, to help him remember the year he was going to add, 1874, his favorite brother, was born, William, was born in 1874. So that helped him remember. And when he was doing Butch Cassidy, Mike Cassidy was his friend, so he kept Cassidy, the last name Cassidy. That's how outlaws remember names. Matt Warner did the same thing with, uh, with the name Matt Warner because his original name was Willard or Rasha Chris Jansen. He picked up, they pick out names so that they help remember them because you don't want to be changing your alias all the time because you can't remember what you did. So the book has everything in it. I like the idea, everyone says, well, I can't wait to see the sources in the back of your book. I don't have any sources in the back of my book. I have the sources in the, right, where it happens. If, a, if somebody was there when the robbery took place, that person that was robbed tells you. You don't have to sort through my book to find out where it came from. Most writers will say, I wrote the article, you have to go find that article someplace to read it if it's true. And most of the time, those articles aren't true because you have to find out and check their sources and everything. I show you everything so you don't have to spoon through and, and find things to see if it's, if it's accurate. I have the actual newspaper clipping. I have the actual magazine. I have the actual photograph so that you know it's there. That's the beauty of the whole thing. This is how I wanted to read a book. My 2000 book that came out, my publisher, 
changed everything because he told everything, everyone the book was his. Mm. He kept left things out. He added things that uh, I didn't even know anything about. He added somebody that, and I says, who is this? I had no idea. He added. Mm. So I had to rechange things. He left out things because he didn't have money to bring it out the way we had originally talked about. This is a book that, to me, is the final word on Butch. And Sundance and Matt Warner will tell you what you want to know and tell you about the other outlaws. And if you agree with me, fine. If you don't agree with me, fine. I don't care. I just present the stuff. I offer my opinion. But you'll know which is my opinion and what was said at that particular time. So like I said, when you first gave me that book, I thumbed through it and I could not believe all the pictures of, like you said, newspaper article, yep. family pictures, all, all that. I've never seen so many pictures in one book before. Yeah. It was uh, amazing and I can't wait to dive into this book. Yeah, it's, it, it, it is fun. And what, what is really cool is you can dive in here, get out dive in another place. You don't have to read it from cover to cover right, right at once. You can just dive back and forth because it's got so much material and, and a lot of meat. There's some fluff. There's some just some, some great stuff. Pictures that people have talked about but never shown. And I get excited about it. This is uh, every time I look at the book, I feel better about it each time. And I, I and I'm not just bra uh, bragging about it because it's it, it, it's a, a labor of love for me because it's it's something that I worked on for a long time and I made promises to all these people and there's so many people that have died and people said well you don't have to honor them they're dead I do have to honor them because my word is my bond cool and. Uh, I respect the people that I worked with and the people that supplied me with photos, people that supplied me with information. And, uh, and I want to thank everybody that, that helped me, even the people that I didn't get along with. I still, uh, if you look at the back of the book, you'll see lots of people's names that I gave thanks to, even people that I wasn't particularly fond of. I gave them credit for helping me. People that also that was just nice to me when I was down a little bit when I on the doing the research when I went up against the dead end. They helped me, and that was when when I first met you. Uh, helped me and. You've done a, 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 an immense amount of things for me, and I'm not just saying that, Terry. Either you've done some some great things, but this book is. I feel really good about it, and thank you very much. Well, thank you, and and uh, and I just want to say that this this has got a lot of new information. Yes, not ever been published before. Yes, three quarters has never been published before. So for anybody that wants to get a hold of your book, how do they get a hold of it? Well, the best way is to contact Eborn Books. And we have a, a, a number listed and a website. And uh, you can post that. Or you can contact me. And this is my cell phone. And I normally don't give out my cell phone, but I'm going to give it out. Oh man, you're going to get flooded with calls. I Hope you're prepared for this. It's it, it's okay. Uh, 801 739 3089. That number again is 801 739 3089. And the books are $35. They went up because of COVID, everything went up. Oh, shipping's gone up. Just crazy. Yeah. Just, yeah, just shipping it, it, alone. Yeah, it's 35 and I th can't remember if there's a $5 uh, shipping fee uh, on that, but I know the back of the book it says 35 But you can order it from uh, Eborn, but if uh, you uh, 
and you can call me and talk to me and if you have any questions I'll be free to, to, to answer. It's been a fun long haul and 61 years is a long time longer than anyone dead or alive that's been doing research. I know man it's been a labor of love for you and you have spent your lifetime I, research and gathering all yeah. that and, and just to say about the price of your book again um, I've never seen a book with so many pictures in it usually because the cost is so much yes and I cannot believe well all the, all the pictures in this book. well and the reason why is because I did all the layouts myself you know nobody else did t all of the layouts it's I designed it the way I wanted it to be I didn't let somebody else do it I my other books somebody else took charge I, I'd laid them out before and then somebody else came in and said oh we don't need it this way and and this way it's exactly the way I wanted it and there are so many really cool pictures that you've never seen before and only hope to have found awesome of that steve man i appreciate you and, and that's a wrap